Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the fourth talk on trustworthiness, reliability, and material science for aircraft structure. My name is Andrew Ang, and I have Professor Rhys Jones with me. Um, before we begin, I would like to respectfully acknowledge the Wurundjeri people and their elders past and present, who are the traditional owners of the land on which Swinburne campuses are located in, the Melbourne's East and Outer East. Now, please allow me to introduce our speaker today, Professor Rhys Jones, AC. He's an internationally renowned, acknowledged um, researcher in uh, that, that played a pioneering role in the use of advanced composites to extend operational life of both military and civilian aircraft. Professor Jones obtained his PhD from Adelaide University uh, in 1974. He first joined Swinburne, then the DSTO Group Aeronautic Research Lab until 1993. Then Professor Jones joined Monash as the Chair Professor of the Mechanical Engineering uh, Department until he retired in 2017. He still retains his affiliation as Emeritus Professor there. Uh, he was made a Companion of the Order of Australia in 2018 uh, for eminent service in mechanical, aerospace engineering and to education as an academic researcher and author, particularly in the areas of aircraft, research, structural mechanics, corrosion repair, and airworthiness. It is the highest honor that can be given to an Australian citizen. Um, Prof, Prof Jones' paper on thermal elasticity has been chosen by the then chief defense scientist as a top 10 defense science paper for that period of time uh, between 2007 and 2008. And nine, I think. Somewhere 2007, 2018. Yeah. Prof. Jones also is also a recipient of the Institutes of Engineering, Engineers Australia Engineering Excellence Award for his work on the Mirage 3 aircraft. Together with uh, Neil Matthews, our first uh, speaker of this whole series at RUAC, Reese has also pioneered the development of cold spray to ensure continued airworthiness. It is my great delight. Uh, to to invite uh, Professor Reese now to give a talk on examples of how to perform durability and damage tolerance analysis mandated in standards MIL, uh, standard 1530D and DSSG 2006 and structural bulletin EZ19-01. Uh, I will be the moderator of this talk. Please use the QA function on the right side of the screen um, to ask questions throughout this talk. Um, the floor is yours now, Professor Jones. In this talk, I'm going to present examples of how to perform the durability and damage tolerance data analysis that are mandated in more standard 1530D JSSG 2006 and Structures Bulletin EZ 1901. The requirements for the airworthiness certification of military aircraft are delineated in JSSG 2006, MIL Standard 1530D, and for additively manufactured airframes in United States Structures Bulletin EZ 1901. Before proceeding, it's necessary to introduce the definition of durability. The definition is given in JSSG 2006 and also in most standard 1530D, and it's on this particular slide. The situation with respect to the airworthiness certification of additively manufactured airframes and AM repairs such as cold spray repairs, which also known as supersonic deposition, and laser additive deposition changed dramatically in March 2019. At this point, the United States Undersecretary for Acquisition and Sustainment stated that as of March 2019, the DAOD will use additive manufacturing to enable the transformation of maintenance operations, supply chains, increase resilience, and improves the self-sustainment and readiness. The memo also stated that AM parts or AM repair processes 
can be used in both critical and non-critical applications. This is particularly important because up until then, things like cold spray could only be used for non-critical geometry restoration applications. The memo also went on to say that if you're going to do it in critical areas, then you've got to use the appropriate level of qualification certification. What this means is that all AM parts or AM replacement parts and all additively manufactured repairs have got to have a durability assessment. One of the problems faced by operational aircraft is the long time scales associated with getting a conventionally manufactured part. What this means is that in order to maintain aircraft availability, the use of an AM part, even if it has an operational life that's less than the original design life, is an attractive option. Previously noted that the United States Structures Bulletin, EZ-1901, which is the guidelines for the implementation, airworthiness acceptance of AM parts and AM repairs, it states that the most difficult challenge for an AM part is to establish an accurate prediction of its structural performance, specifically its data durability and damage tolerance. As Robert Baer, United States Air Force explained, AM is going to reach its greatest potential when it can address the questions of cracking, damage and safety of flight parts. This would mean that AM could be used in a production environment it also means you can do rapid repairs and allow for repairs that outside the current supply chain. However, as he also said, in order to do this, the development of analytical methods to analyze AM parts is absolutely essential. In recent years, the United States have introduced the concept of using additive manufacturing to rapidly field limited life or attributable unmanned air vehicles. The certification of such limited life airframes requires a durability analysis. There's a definition on this slide of what is termed attributability, and it comes from particularly United States Air Force report. Blue standard 1530D explains that analysis is key to the durability and damage tolerance design of military airplanes. It also states that the primary role of full scale testing is to validate or correct analysis methods. An essential feature of any data analysis is that you have a similitude parameter that you can use both for the analysis and to ensure that lab test data, which is obtained using simplified geometries, can be directly related to cracking in the fleet. The crack tip similitude parameter in the laboratory test specimens must have the same value as in the airplane, otherwise you're wasting your time. When you're performing a damage tolerance or a durability analysis, you use curves like the one here that relate the stress intensity factor, or delta K, to the crack growth rate, DADN. Unfortunately, delta K is not a valid similitude parameter. One thing to note here is you've got a near threshold region, which is region one, a region where the Paris growth law is supposed to hold, and region three, where you have very fast growth, essentially tearing. So let us define similitude. The definition here essentially comes out of the United States Air Force Damage Tolerance Design Handbook. Similitude, 
Well, if you have two cracks, same material, but different geometries, and they have the same crack tip similitude parameter, which I've called delta kappa, then both cracks will grow at the same rate, regardless of the crack size, the crack length, etc. The similitude parameter delta kappa that I'm going to use in this uh, talk is given by equation two. It involves two parameters, namely a fatigue threshold term, delta KTH sub R, and a cyclic fracture toughness term, A. The fatigue threshold term here is related to the traditional delta KTH term, which you get out of E647 by the equation on the slide. With this definition of delta kappa, the crack growth equation is given by equation one, which looks pretty much like a Paris equation, but with delta K replaced by delta kappa. As I said in the introduction, the purpose of this talk is to illustrate, give examples of how to perform a durability or a data analysis. So let's start with 316L. In accordance with the building block approach, the first thing we need to be able to do is to characterize crack growth in the material under constant amplitude loading. In other words, how do you characterize the DADN versus delta K curve? We are going to show how if you relate DADN to delta kappa, which is the similitude parameter that we've discussed earlier on, then it doesn't matter whether the material is manufactured conventionally, whether it is built using additive manufacturing processes, or whether it's fabricated using cold spray additively manufactured processes. CSAM, and sometimes I call it just CS for shortness. To illustrate that, we're going to have a number of tests discussed. Some of these tests are on cold spray additive and manufactured specimens. There are material when you manufacture them with additive manufacturing or cold spray is anisotropic. So we're going to present tests in both the LS and the LT directions. We're going to discuss tests which are as printed and tests which the specimens have been as printed and then annealed. We're going to compare these data sets with conventionally manufactured, in this case, rolled specimens. And we're also going to compare the test data with 316L produced using selective layer melting, which is an additive manufacturing process. And as built using selective layer melting and then hipped. Hipped is short for hot isostatic pressing. And we're going to show that whereas expressing the ADN versus delta K gives a whole variety of disparate curves, when you express it as delta kappa, these curves will all collapse. Now, the difference between these different manufacturing processes is all due to the difference in the apparent cyclic fracture toughness and also in the difference in the fatigue thresholds that these different manufacturing processes result in. This slide presents the DADN versus delta K curves that I discussed previously. The red dots are from traditionally manufactured 316L. Uh, the data is taken from the NASCRO database. I've also got curves here associated with selector laser melt 
and specimens which have been built using selective major melt and then hipped. And all of the other curves are associated with cold spray specimens in two perpendicular directions, with the specimens being either aspirated or aspirated and then annealed, heat treated. If you look at this, you can see there's a widespread of thresholds and a moderately widespread toughnesses. And that results in very different curves, which look to have different slopes, particularly in the Paris region. And basically, you've got a whole part of different curves. The purpose of this slide is to illustrate that if you now plot DADN against the similitude parameter delta kappa, then all of those very different curves collapse onto a single master curve. What I've shown on this particular slide is that they all collapse to the master curve that was given in a prior paper for additive manufactured 316L. The values of the constants that are used in the x-axis to determine delta kappa are also given on this slide. I previously mentioned that additive manufactured material is highly anisotropic. Nevertheless, expressing the ADN in terms of the similitude parameter accounts for this anisotropic behavior. To illustrate that, let us consider compact tension specimens that were built using selective laser melt where the specimens had been cut at different angles to the build direction. As previously, the data I'm going to discuss is taken from the open literature, and in this case, from reference 14. This slide just gives the test descriptors and the associated treatments that have been done for the 30-ish specimens I'm going to examine. So for example, on the first row, you've got specimen has a build angle of zero. It was manufactured using SLM, and then it was annealed at 735 degrees centigrade, and it's called double zero dash two. The values of the threshold term and the value of the cyclic fracture toughness used to determine the similitude parameter are given in the slide, as is the coefficient of determination, R squared, that you can get out of a, an Excel spreadsheet. All of them are very, very good. The ability to accurately perform the durability analysis for each of these 20 plus cracks is shown in this slide. Here you see the predictions compared to the experimental data. The agreement is exceptionally good. I should stress that the variability in this particular instance is due entirely to the variability in the fatigue threshold and every test has assumed the same fracture toughness. The initial source sizes in the analysis and in the test are comparable to the mandated ease. Should be stressed that JSSG requires an A basis property. Since there is only one variable, namely the fatigue threshold, fatigue threshold for these 20 cracks enables there an A basis to be easily calculated. It's the mean minus three sigma. 
if you do that from the data in the previous curve, what you get is that the A basis fatigue threshold lies in the range 0.1 to 0.3, which coincides exactly with the fatigue threshold associated with small near micron type cracks. The reference for this is at the bottom of the slide. If you're going to do a durability assessment, particularly of additive manufactured or cold spray repairs or laser additive deposition repairs, then there are instances when you need to account for the residual stress. So let's look at a problem where there was a significant residual stress field. This particular example is taken from reference 15, and it's a compact tension specimen, but in front of the crack tip, the region was laser shock peened. The purpose of that is to introduce residual stresses in the specimen. Laser shock peening is something that's widely used nowadays in several um, operational aircraft. The particular material, the substrate, is 2024T3. So before you can do an analysis, the first thing you've got to do is pull out from NASCRO the DADN versus delta K data and then determine the associated DADN versus delta kappa. And that's done in the graph to the right, as are the constants in the expression. So you know then how DADN is related to delta kappa for this base material 2024 T3. So this raises the question, how do I count for the residual stress field? Well, the residual stress field will give rise to a residual stress intensity factor. All right? How do I account for that residual stress intensity factor when I calculate delta K? So first of all, you have to calculate the true maximum and the true minimum taking account of these residual stresses. All right. The delta K becomes unaffected, but the R ratio does not. The R ratio changes because the true minimum delta K over the true maximum delta K is directly affected by the residual stress field. If you're going to do the analysis using the formulation of described above, then in order to calculate delta kappa, you have to determine what the true fatigue threshold is. If you have experimental data that will relate the true fatigue threshold to R ratio, you're okay. If you don't, there is a particular formula that you can use developed by Art McEverly. It's not bad. It's not bad. And it's given in this slide. For the problem outlined in the previous slide, the paper we referred to gave the residual R ratio and it also gave the residual stress intensity factors as well as the true maximum and the true minimum stress intensity factors and the true delta Ks. The previous slide gave you the values needed for the crack growth equation, the values of D and the exponent. So consequently, you can use those values to compute the crack growth history. All right. Slide on the left, the slide on the left. I'm sorry, I mean the graph on the left 
shows you the actual measured DADN or crack growth rate as a function of crack length. It also shows you the computed crack growth rate as a function of crack length using the hartmann chivy equation, constants above, and the experimental values of residual stress and K. As you can see, there is very, very good agreement. Having shown how to account for the variability in crack growth and the anisotropy effects in conventional and manufactured materials, let's look at a design study where we're going to examine the potential of commercially pure titanium to build a helicopter lift part. The specific geometry, the specimen we're going to look at shown on the slide, it's a flange plate with a central lightning hole. This specimen is the one that was used by Irvin and Bristow and Lynn in their round robin challenge where they evaluated various damage tolerance analysis procedures. Specimen was subjected to an industry standard flight load spectrum called asterisk and asterisk is a spectrum associated with helicopter lift frame as you would expect the spectrum consists of about 370,000 cycles which represents approximately 190 flights or 140 sorties the maximum remote stress in the spectrum was 130 megapascals. Let us now look at the crack growth behavior of commercial pure titanium. The graph on the left presents the DADN versus delta K curves for grades two, three, and four titanium. It also presents crack growth curves obtained by NASA 7050 T7451, which is one of the most widely used aluminium alloys used in the strike fighter, it's used in the F-18, it's used in the Super Hornet. The curves are for a range of R ratios. They're also for a range of environments. Air, salt, water, dry argon. The plot at the bottom of the curve of the screen presents DADN versus delta K for grade two titanium at a fairly wide range of R ratios. If you look at the curves on the left and the curves at the bottom of the screen, you can see they're widely scattered. However, if you plot DADN against delta kappa, which is the similitude parameter, then what you find is all of these curves collapse onto a single curve. And what is most interesting is that curve corresponds to the curve for 7050 T7451. Details on where all of these data points came from can be found in the paper here, the bottom reference number 17. The values of the fatigue threshold and the Apparent cyclic fracture toughness used to collapse these curves are given in this slide. So as previously, what you see is that the difference in the fatigue performance, the DADN versus delta K conform performance, is entirely due to the threshold and the toughness. The constants D and the fracture proportionality the hartmann chivy equation are not affected by the manufacturing process, only the toughnesses and the thresholds. Equally interesting, you see that it collapses onto the same curve that you see for 7050 T7451. That's just, of course, fortuitous, but it's a very interesting and it's an important observation. 
since the purpose of the analysis is to compare a lift frame made from commercially pure titanium with that made from the original material, we are going to compare the crack growth histories for the CP lift frame with that for the 7010 T73651 aluminum alloy original lift frame. Before you can do the fatigue analysis, however, you need to know the stress intensity factor solution. Fortunately, reference 18 gave the stress intensity factor solution for this shape in the form K equals F times sigma square root pi A, where F is a boundary correction factor. They also gave the boundary correction factor. The correction factor can be seen in the graph on the left-hand side. Again, we had done an analysis of this particular lift problem. And you can see the experimental data on the right-hand graph. And you can also see the crack growth predictions that we've done for the 7010 T73651 aluminum alloy. Now we have the stress intensity factor solutions. We've characterized commercially pure grade two titanium. In other words, we know how to relate the ADN to delta kappa. We can therefore use the stress intensity factor solution in conjunction with the material behavior and also the fight load spectrum, and we can make a prediction. The crack growth curves for grade two commercially pure titanium are shown as purple marks on the graph on the right hand side. The first thing you immediately see is that crack growth in commercially pure titanium lift frame under the same flight load spectrum is dramatically slower. The grade two titanium lift frame is far more damage tolerant than the original design. This example illustrates how a commercially pure grade two titanium lift frame is significantly more damage tolerant than the original aluminum alloy design. As such, it illustrates the potential for commercially pure titanium to be used for limited life airframes. Okay, so now let's address how to do a durability analysis. Durability assessment, as per JSSG 2006 and MIL standard 1530D, mandates an assumed minimum initial damage size or EADS of no less than 0.01 of an inch or 0.254 millimeters. One of the problems when you attempt to do a durability analysis where you have such small EADS is you have to be aware of the variability that can occur with such small EADS. To illustrate that, I'm going to look at the growth of small ead size damage in 7050 T7451. The damage was initiated by having multiple initiation sites. The specimen is subjected to block loading. So we had 15,000 cycles at an R ratio of 0.1, 300 cycles at an R ratio of 0.1. Eight. But the maximum load in the cycle was kept fixed at round about 140 kilonewtons. This all comes out of the paper at the bottom of the slide. The reason for having multiple initiation sites was that 
it enabled you then to look at the variability of cracks growing from each side. Damage, I shall say that again, Eads size damage in an aerospace material. Back to the multiple crack specimen that we talked about two slides back. This is a picture of some of the cracks that initiated, nucleated is the correct word, in that particular specimen or those particular specimens because there were several of them. There are lots of them, really small. So you're able to work out the crack growth rates associated with one of these particular small cracks. And as I said, the initiation sizes were of the order of the EADS required in the standards. In other words, they were of the order of 0.25 millimeters. This slide gives the values of the initial floor sizes. That's on the table on the left, associated with their designations. On the right hand side, in the second table, are the thresholds associated with each of the cracks. At this stage, be noted that the only variable is the threshold and that the toughness for this particular thickness material and this material um, is given from a previous paper. The constants, 7 to minus 10 and 2, that you'll need to do the durability analysis taken from the previous slide. By this, I mean from the slide that shows the long crack data. Constants in the equation are independent of the length of the crack. The ability to accurately perform the durability analysis for each of these 20 plus cracks is shown in this slide. Here you see the predictions compared to the experimental data. The agreement is exceptionally good. I should stress that the variability in this particular instance is due entirely to the variability in the fatigue threshold and every test has assumed the same fracture toughness. The initial floor sizes in the analysis and in the test are comparable to the mandated ease. Should be stressed that JWSG requires an A basis property. Since there is only one variable, namely the fatigue threshold, fatigue threshold for these 20 cracks enables there an A basis to be easily calculated. It's the mean minus three sigma. If you do that from the data in the previous curve, what you get is that the A basis fatigue threshold lies in the range 0.1 to 0.3, which coincides exactly with the fatigue threshold associated with small near micron type cracks. The reference for this is at the bottom of the slide. The previous example of durability calculation was for a simple loading and a simple specimen. So let's now proceed to look at cracking in an F-18 center barrel. This particular material is also 7050 B7451. And the F18 has three bulkheads, as you can see here, where the bit where the wings attach. Oh, well, the three bulkheads are seen on the right. Failure of a bulkhead will cause loss of airplane. Question is: can we perform the durability analysis using the constant amplitude small crack data, which is derived also from the long crack data by setting the threshold to a small value, typically of the order of 0.1 to 0.3. It was obtained from a full-scale fatigue test on F-18 center barrel performed by Mr. Laurie Malent at DST. 
So the barrel was fought, was subjected to a representative combat aircraft flight load spectrum. Maximum load corresponds to 7.1 G. The bottom line is that if you use the equation that you previously determined for 7050 T7451, and as previously you set the threshold to a small value, typically 0.1, then the agreement between the predicted durability and the measured crack growth rate in the bulkhead test is exceptionally good. In fact, on this curve, you can't see a difference. Let's move on. Different airplane, different flight load spectrum. In this case, let's try and evaluate the effect of Integrated corrosion on a RAF AP3C Orion. I'm going to look at regions in here where there are dome nut fastener holes. The environment gets in and causes intergranular corrosion and also corrosion down the, corrosion pitting, I should say, down the hole. In order to study this problem, Raf and myself analyzed tests that were performed by the Australian Defence Science and Technology Group. These tests involved specimens that were cut from the wing. Specimens contained the fastener holes and the satellite holes, and they had created intergranular corrosion at the holes. As I mentioned before, the work was done through the RAF. In particular, I'd like to say thank you to Adam Bowler and also to Michael Dorman. Work was also performed in conjunction with Navair, and I'd like to say thank you to Nam Pham at Navair. The specimens were tested under two different flight load spectra. These two spectra are listed in the slide, and they correspond to fatigue critical locations as shown in the slide where we can see the wing broken up into regions. Well, as with any complex problem, the first thing you need to do is to create an uncracked model of the region. In this case, you need to include the intergranular corrosion, corrosion, but you don't model any fatigue cracks. Details of the nature of the intergranular corrosion get on the slide. You then use the stress field in conjunction with either stress function solutions or weight function solutions to compute the stress and tension factors as the crank grows. The constants in the crack growth equation for this material had already been published in a prior paper between RAF, Navair, and myself. So all that was necessary was to Perform the durability analysis. Now, a number of tests were done, and this slide shows the results for both fatigue critical location 352 and 361. There are multiple ways of doing an analysis for durability, and the United States Damage Tolerance Design Handbook allows you to do two different analyses, one based upon cycle by cycle analysis and the other one based upon a characteristic approach developed by the United States Air Force. As you'll see from these slides, both approaches gave excellent results. And the durability analyses basically reproduce the test data very well. 
Let me try and draw this talk to a conclusion. Meeting the certification requirements as delineated in North Standard 1530D, USAF Structures Bulletin EZ 1901, and JSSG 2006, means that a durability, or so called economic life, analysis is essential. This requires a valid crack tip similitude parameter, and you need to be able to capture the variability in material behavior. Expressing the ADN as a function of delta kappa enables you to do this. Steps. So you first create an uncracked finite element model of the structure. You use this model together with either the truss function solution or a weight function solution to compute the stress intensity factors associated with naturally occurring three cracks with the required ease. Now, the minimum required ease, remember, is 0.01 of an inch or 0.254 of a millimeter. When you're doing a durability analysis, you need to set the fatigue threshold term delta K THI to a small value, typically 0.1 to 0.3. If you do this, then your durability analysis will be both accurate and reasonably conservative. I've tried to give a thumbnail description of the damage tolerance and durability requirements for military airplanes and how to do the durability assessment. I've given several examples, but I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. Oh, well, I hand over to you. Thank you very much for being attentive. So we're ready to take some questions <laughs> now from uh, together with Reese. Um, Okay, we've got some questions coming in. Reese, you can read it too, if you want to, since you're beside me. But uh, how, the first question is from Sam. How are the crack tip dimensions captured? How are the crack tip dimensions okay. crack, captured? Probably not a speaker. Yeah, yeah, a speaker. Okay, um, it depends what test you're doing. If we're talking about long cracks, there are multiple ways of doing it. I mean, you can, well, there are multiple ways of measuring long cracks. Um, if you're talking about small cracks, then the best way to do it is using fractography. Um, oh, yep, best ways to do it using fractography. Um, the second question that I have from an uh, anonymous person is, thanks for this wonderful talk. I'm curious to know, about a few uh, about a few things below. Uh, what is the effect of hydrogen embrittlement on the crack behavior? Uh, that's the first one. And second, how does the grain boundary uh, effect with heaping treatment? I think let's go with these two first, and then I will ask the third question later. Yep. Um, that's a really good question. Um. I think we could take the rest of this talk to talk about hydrogen embrittlement. Um, it's a topic in itself. I'm actually going to dodge uh, that and talk about grain boundary effects. Yes. How does it affect with heaping treatment? Well, let's go back a stage. Uh, grain boundary effects. Um, are an artifact of doing the wrong test. Um, so in other words, if you read the ASTM E647 standard, go into, well, ASTM E647 is a bloody big document. It gives a whole pile of tests that you can do to determine the DADN versus uh, delta K curves for long cracks. When you do these tests, you find that there are quite significant grain boundary effects. Most people only read the main body of the text. If, however, you read Appendix X3, 
Appendix X3 says, for cracks in operational structures, the um, methodology described in the main body of the, of the document is inapplicable. All right? So if you're now talking about cracks in operational structures, or cracks in operational structures, I'm really talking here about airplanes, but you can talk about bridges as well. Um, they tend to arise from small, naturally occurring material discontinuities. If you look at the crack growth curves with respect to small, naturally occurring material discontinuities, the first thing you find is there are no grain boundary effects. There are, if you want to look at a paper where all of this is summarized, there's a paper, I wrote a paper for the 60th anniversary of the Journal of Engineering Fracture Mechanics, it's an invited paper, in which this is discussed at length, and the materials community is challenged to explain why there are no micro, there are no grain boundary effects, why there are no microstructural effects in uh, for small cracks. Okay, if you read the standards and go back again and read AASHTO, which is the American Association for Highway and Transportation Organizations, you'll find this is explained. This is stated in the AASHTO. Um, uh, manuals. Handbook, yeah. Yep. So you don't have it. Consequently, hipping uh, the the question, the, the business about hipping is is largely decoupled from the question about microstructure. There's not, there is virtually no data that talks about small, naturally occurring the crack growth rates behave as the small naturally occurring cracks. However, there is a review and a recent review that came out this year and it says pretty much what I've just said uh, previously. It's unlimited data, but that's basically all the data that we've got. People need to go and generate. That's a long winded answer to a very interesting question. <laughs> Sorry. Yep. So, um, I'm going to ask the next question and combine um, the, 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 the question that was also posted on the chat. We, we talked a lot about AM. What about additive repair? Um, how does this um, analysis relate to, say, a cold spray repair that you have been doing with, with uh, say, RUAC or, or Defense? Is it still applicable or, and, and how do we actually use it? Well, if you do your Cold spray, and I'm going to talk about cold spray repairs, OK? Um, the main reason for that is that there's an enormous amount of uh, experimental data now on cold spray repairs. Um, all of the data, I should add, is RUAG intellectual property. I'm saying that because I imagine that Neil may be listening in or somebody from RUAG, but it's all RUAG intellectual property. And um, quite a bit of the work, some limited predictions will be gone through in the cold spray action uh, team meeting in the US in June. But basically the answer to your question is that you do not get cracking in the, um, added, in the, in the added material. The cracking in additive management repairs, repairs occurs at the interface between the cold spray and the substrate. And it's extremely well predictable. It, the initiation, the initial floor sizes tend to be of uh, tend to be of the order of tens of microns if you do the process right. Mm. But it's extremely predictable, um, and we've actually analyzed something like fifty to a hundred cracks. Let's let's cut, come over. Say let's say seventy cracks, um, and each one of those is what you can't see the difference between the predictions and the experimental data. Yeah, and it always happens at the interface instead it, of. Yeah, there. that's if you do it correctly. OK, so the last question for the session. Additive manufacturing is often tilted for its ability to produce geometries that cannot be produced uh, by uh, other processes. This, uh, this assimilative process uh, suitable for, is, is this durability assessment? Uh, also suitable when we cannot access the internal features for institute verification. 
Okay, when it, it, there, there are two kinds of internal features. There are internal features where the crack is occurring on the outer surface, and there are internal features where the material discontinuity from, from which the cracks nucleate in, are, in, are occurring yeah. internal to the structure. Yeah. There is so little data on the crack growth behavior for internal for, for uh, cracks that nucleate from internal material discontinuity, these SN curves. But remember the, the uh, standards um, forbid the use of SN. Did I say that strong enough? This, the standards for aerospace forbid the use for SN curves. You are required to do a damage tolerance, um, uh, fracture mechanics calculations. Yes. Uh, there is so little data on the crack growth behavior of naturally occurring cracks from internal material discontinuities that the question can't be asked, answered. If you're talking about cracking that nucleates from surface, from the interaction of surface roughness and material discontinuities, um, then there is also very, very little data. Uh, there's, there's also very little data. There is indication you can do the, you should be able to do the analyses, but this is the topic of a lot of work, some of which that we are doing with the uh, US. Yep. So in other words, uh, to, 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 to Sam, the, the, the person that asked the question, yep, is a, is a, is a unknown still, um, lots of things to, to, to research. And uh, that is actually a good note uh, because we, uh, we, we actually have uh, issued the challenge um now i would like to um end sort of the, the, the this part of the talk and thank Reese for his time and 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 all um so i would also like to publicize the fifth and most likely the final talk for our series that's given by professor alan lau on uh aircraft composite repairs so we have switched from metals to composite now again uh fundamentals to structural health monitoring that will happen in about four weeks' time. Um, Vesna and, uh, uh, and and Seam will actually send out the um, the the invites. Um, so thank you again for spending the morning with us. I hope you picked up a few tips and tricks of doing your durability analysis next time. Um, and we are happy to continue this um, conversation offline if you have. Um, and take care and stay safe. For those uh, in Victoria, um, take care and I will see you next time. Bye.